Chemcon is the place for authorities and compliance driven companies to meet and share knowledge and experiences and of course to network. However, it's more a boot camp than a cocktail party. Nevertheless, today's interview focuses on a cocktail's more specific, the cocktail effect. Every day we're all unintendedly exposed to a cocktail of substances. So it seems fair to say that the cocktail effect needs to be considered when regulating substances of concern and calculating limit values. One option is to use a mixer assessment factor. Is this needed? And if so, can this be a generic approach or should this be implemented more pragmatic? I will discuss this with Peter Corritar from the European Commission DG Environment and Arndt Weijers from Bayer. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Peter, the mixture assessment factor approach is part of the toxic free roadmap of the chemical strategy for sustainability. Can you explain why the mixture assessment factor is considered and what it aims to achieve? As you may know, the EU has a comprehensive set of the chemical legislation uh, to protect the human health and the environment. And this legislation is designed to, to address the concern from the individual chemicals and from intentional mixtures like cosmetics, detergents or the products of the everyday use. However, you and me and all of us are uh, exposed not to one chemical or to one intentional mixture, but we are exposed to many chemicals at the same time coming from different sources. Whether we wake up in the morning, we brush the teeth, we, we take a shower with a, with a shampoo and so on. And our legislation is not uh, at the moment uh, adequately equipped to deal with such, a, uh, such a unintentional exposures. Considering the current situation that those co-exposures are not known and they will remain to be not known. And even if we are known, they, they still we don't know about the toxicity of individual components. We need a pragmatic and workable solution. And one of a MAF or a mixture assessment factor or mixture allocation factor is such uh, a solution. So what we are trying to achieve is introduce a mixture assessment factor in REACH is to address unintentional co-exposure at the moment when the assessment of individual substances is done, even though we don't know the real co-exposures and we don't know enough about the toxicities uh, of the other co-exposed substances. The EU likes to portray itself as the global leader in regulating chemicals. Um, is the EU the first region to consider MAF or are there similar initiatives elsewhere? Well, uh, mixture assessment factor is not an invention of the EU. I think it's a it's a approach which has been there here before. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been also successfully applied in the legislation. We have examples from the United States where the mixture uh, the risk cap approach, which is a very similar approach, is used uh, for pesticides in uh, I think it calls Food Quality Protection Act. It's also used in the drinking water uh, standards derivation by the World Health Organization. And one of our member states, the Netherlands, is using the mixture assessment factor in uh, deriving the, uh, the national environmental quality standards for the river basins in the Netherlands. Uh, Arndt, several decision makers and regulatory authorities seem to be reaching consensus that the MAF is indeed a reasonable and useful approach. What will be the impact of MAF on industry, like yourself, and consumers? Well, we have several studies from uh, CEFIC and CEFIC members that show uh, a high impact on both the uh, companies who register substances, but subsequently also, of course, the consumers who want to use the substances in, in the end, uh, with a very unclear situation about the environmental benefit. I think the, the important point is to understand that uh, if you if you use a tiered approach in risk assessment, as you do under REACH, you make very conservative assumptions in the first assessment, and then um, you um, use this as a filter to filter out cases of low concern. That is not the same as identifying substances of high concern. Therefore, if you take these, uh, say, super worst case assumptions in a, in a simple uh, REACH risk assessment that makes correctly to filter out the cases of low concern, um, makes assumptions uh, that are very conservative. If you then add all of them up, then you end up with, a, with an unrealistic scenario. Uh, Peter, what is your vision on the impact of MAF on industry and consumers? The overall impact will of course depend on how the MAF will be implemented and integrated in REACH and also what will the value of, of MAF be. But generally, 
uh, on consumers, we of course uh, assume that uh, uh, or expect that there will be a better protection of uh, human health and the environment. Of course, if there is a situation where the chemical will be found out that it's not safe anymore, the, the chemical might disappear from the product and consumer either will have a product with a different chemical or in, in a certain situation can lose the, the product. Arndt, you already mentioned Cefic, eh? you're part of Cefic's MAF group uh, that's developing a decision tree to decide if uh, MAF needs to be applied. Can you explain the concept of this decision tree? Well, the, the basic elements uh, are that you consider hazard and tonnage and exposure, so exposure potential. So hazard means that you differentiate between the compounds that are likely contribute to contribute a lot in real world environmental samples. I think we'll come back to that in, uh, in a minute. Um, based on hazard properties, these could for example be, but it's only an example, PBT properties, so persistent bioaccumulative and toxic substances, could be aquatic hazard criteria, it could be, it could be other criteria, but uh, substances that have the potential really in, uh, in relevant amounts in the environment to cause a harm. And I concentrate here on the environment because I'm not a human health expert. And uh, the second element obviously is, is tonnage, that is something that is also built into reach in, uh, in various, uh, various aspects because uh, tonnage simply relates to the potential to have a, a very widespread uh, exposure. And the third element would be use categories in terms of um, uh, uh, exposure potential. There are uses that obviously have a high potential to end up more or less everywhere and others that are so confined that you do not need to mix them with everything. A range of values for MAF have been proposed in the debate about the size of the MAF. Um, proposals for MAF vary from 2, 10, 20, 50 to 100. According to the Swedish Chemicals Agency, a MAF of 10 seems sufficiently protective for the majority of mixtures, like a little bit over 70%. What would, according to you, be a reasonable MAF or RCR? It's a bit premature for me to say. I do not know at the moment. We are doing this impact assessment and clearly the value of a mixture assessment factor is the component of assessing the, the impact. Generally what I would say, the mixture assessment factor when we are estimating the value of it and trying to, to, to derive it based on the, the real data from, from the monitoring either in the environment or in humans, should not be overprotective, but should not be underprotective. So it should not be overestimated, uh, not uh, underestimated. And generally, I would say there has to be a, a the good benefit, a good uh, improvement in the protection at a reasonable cost or at a low cost, I would say. And how is the industry balancing here? I think we're essentially trying to balance on science. And what, what science is telling us is um, that if you look at real world, uh, mixtures, then typically very few compounds dominate. Because if you see that typically very few substances dominate, that tells you that you would, that a, a rather low MAF would already do the trick. If you believe that a MAF is useful, I don't, but uh, okay, um, then you, you don't need a very large MAF. This is based on monitoring data, of course, but if you look at monitoring data and the toxic pressure, then the current use chemicals, if you all of them take away, changes very little. So I think this, this balance is not only between uh, impact uh, and how much, how much harm does a MAF do, but also between uh, impact and how much uh, of the desired effect uh, will, will actually actually happen. When you look at that, then uh, a rather small MAF would already cover the majority of the current use uh, substances if you take them together. Well, I mean, as part of the impact assessment, we do a lot of studies and also collecting a lot of uh, evidence. So I would agree to the fact that uh, the, the toxicology or the kind of impact on the, uh, in the samples are usually coming from the relatively small number of uh, substances. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to have a more systematic approach which this mixture assessment factor offers. 
or might offer. And I, and I agree with you, we need to look at what would be the, the impact. We need to make this mixture assessment factor value right. We, we should not, as I said, not overestimate, but also not underestimate. So Peter, what then are the considerations? Should it be a generic approach or a more tailored approach? A company responsible to ensure safety of a chemical. Yeah. And you have to do it without knowing what other chemicals are coming on the market, what other co-exposures will happen, and what are the toxicity of those other chemicals which will interact with yours. So I do not really see any other <laughs> possibility at the moment how you said this registrant should solve this issue except having a look on the mixture assessment factor and for me this is a tailor as soon as we have a more information where we can actually uh, make a better assessment or make a specific risk assessment we shall go for it aren't i know industry is very much in favor of a more pragmatic approach is this already pragmatic enough or do you have a few suggestions uh, i think it it depends on uh, exactly what substances you target. I think if we uh, ignore the, um, the elements I mentioned before, so hazard, tonnage, exposure potential, then that would mean that we would be affecting the very, very long tail of the distribution that co uh, contributes uh, little to almost nothing to overall toxic pressure in uh, real, real world uh, surface waters. That would again uh, place place a burden on the on the registrants, which I think is, is disproportionate to the original target to improve surface water. Because I mean, if you introduce a new element of regulation, I think it's it's fair to ask yourself, okay, if that works perfectly, now ten years from here, what how would we see the impact? And I think by targeting that very long tail of substances that contribute very little, the answer is nothing at all. We wouldn't be seeing any improvement because the uh, legacy substances dominate, because the very high tonnage substances dominate, because the uh, very hazardous substances dominate, and uh, the rest would be just an administrative burden on, on registrants, but wouldn't, wouldn't contribute much uh, to, to, the overall, um, to the overall impact on the environment. And, and back to the question, how many substances are there? I think what we typically see in all these samples are that uh, one, two, three substances tend to dominate, and you're right, they vary in time and space. So the overall list of substances that have the potential to contribute is longer than that. It's not just three substances, because typically three substances dominate. But the overall list of substances uh, is also very limited. And what we have seen in the, in the surface water assessments is that it's independent of the number of analytes. So if you analyze a lot of substances, we have some monitoring programs where people have looked at 100, 200, 300 substances. We have other monitoring programs that have looked at only 5 or 10 or 15. But the overall picture that emerges is exactly the same. It's very few substances that dominate. If you look over all the water bodies, then it's a few dozen of substances, but it's not 7,000. Arndt, thank you very much for the uh, suggestions for uh, DG Environment. You're always very much open for input from stakeholders. Um, Peter, Arndt is mentioning the decision tree eh, that Cefic came up with. Um, as a suggestion, um, how do you look at that? Well, as you said, we are <coughs> very happy to get any input and ideas to consider. So that's absolutely no doubt about it. When we look on the proposal, so if I understand well the proposal, we have a certain categories of hazards which are supposed to be prioritized, so like uh, PBT, so persistent biotoxic, VPVM, P, uh, uh, PMT. Here I have a like, more uh, reflection on the other risk management measure which we are taking for, for these substances. We already, I mean, we have a policy in place which we want to basically phase out the use of these substances or minimize a lot. So, in addition, a lot of, of these substances is very difficult to set a threshold uh, for because either they don't have a threshold or to derive a DNLP is quite difficult. So, so it's basically applicability or mixture assessment factor for this kind of substances is not possible sometimes. And also sometimes perhaps even redundant in the sense that we are trying to eliminate, eliminate them already through the single uh, risk management measures. 
And so some of the other hazards, so the other ones, I think, I, am, I think we are looking at the most hazardous ones. And I think this approach through the rim, ri, uh, risk characterization ratio is also taking a lot into concern the proposal for Cephic because it is in the risk characterization ratio calculations you take into account emissions, the, the volumes, and ex expected exposures. So it is taken account, into account. You will, if the exposure is minuscule, your RCR or risk characterization ratio will stay low. Yeah. So I think this part we are taking into account. But I think on hazards, I think we should look on all hazards possible, uh, I mean, which are, are relevant for for the fact, because they are overall contributing to overall risk, whether in the environment or for, uh, or for humans. Peter and Arndt, thank you very much for sharing your views on the mixture assessment factor approaches. Curious to see what the outcome will be. Several routes to choose from in the toxic free roadmap. Whether you select the mocktail march, the cocktail crawl, or a mix of both, we all want to avoid a hangover.